This is Horizons Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi loses his majority in parliament, forcing him to lean on allies to form a government. The Indian results surprising investors, the stock bulls reeling after a rout that wiped out $386 billion in market value. And the leader of South Africa's main opposition tells Bloomberg the party is open to coalition talks with the ANC that put the nation's interests first. And it's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jumana Bersechi in Dubai. Lots to digest in terms of how all of these political stories are playing out. Plenty of volatility coming through in stock market indices where there have been these elections. South Africa, obviously a case in point, what we're witnessing overnight in the Indian stock markets. And then also don't forget Mexico, too. So plenty going through on the political side of things. As for markets, you can see that the S&P futures are leaning slightly towards the positive, up two tenths of a percent. Yesterday's jolts opening data surprising to the downside. Yet another catalyst for interest rates to keep rallying. You can see 10-year U.S. Treasuries 4.34 percent right now. We have rallied 30. That is three zero basis points in the last four days. And some of the techni technicians out there are pointing to the fact that the 10-year yield is now sitting just above that 200-day moving average. So key technical level. Keep an eye out for that in the coming days. Euro also in focus ahead of that ECB meeting on Thursday. Expectations are that they will cut, but lots of questions about what sort of language they will use about the path forward. We're going to talk more about that on the show. And then also keeping a close eye on what's been happening to the oil complex since that OPEC meeting. And it is still trading negative. So Brent is trading at around 77.50 today sideways, but down about two, three dollars since that Sunday meeting. And take a look at the Nifty record drop, as you can see, in India's market cap. $390 billion wiped out in yesterday's trade alone. Uh, over the course of the day, the Nifty dropped 6%. Some of the banking stocks were down 7%. Infrastructure down 11% at one point as well. So it, stock market investors did not react kindly to those results that started to come through throughout the course of the day. But we're going to get more on that price action from Avril Hong, who's in our Singapore studio. Avril. Absolutely, Jumana. India assets really in focus today. But before I take you to what we're seeing cross assets in India, let's quickly talk through what we're seeing in the rest of the Asia Pacific because stocks, it's a mixed bag. Bonds are rallying, tracking the U.S. Treasury's performance overnight. It is the tech, the rate sensitive sector that's helping to buoy the Hang Seng and the Kospi on the Nikkei. Those export related stocks taking a beating after two sessions of gains on the Japanese currency but it is taking a bit of a breather on the climb today. Let's flip the board and take you to what we're seeing in India because there were some expectations that we could see a bit of a recovery in the stock market. The Nifty, the Sensex, yesterday declined 6%, worst day in four years. And as you mentioned earlier, $390 billion of market cap just wiped out amid those concerns about whether we will see the Modi government be able to push through some of its uh, infrastructure manufacturing led initiatives. Uh, we are seeing a bit of a recovery now, but don't forget, given the extent of the drop yesterday, this might not be something that we read too much into. Uh, the yield uh, on the India tenure continues to rise well past the 7% level. We're seeing a bit of a recovery, re recovery on the Indian rupee. Jumana. Yeah, fascinating to witness what's happening with some of these Indian assets. Avril, thank you so much for giving us the latest there. Now, let's just bring you up to speed on the political news. Narendra Modi has vowed on to stay as Indian Prime Minister, even as his BJP party loses its parliamentary majority in a surprise swing to rivals. What is happening today is really, in the long run, really good for India because it forces India to choose a different course from the one it has been on, a course which has led to much wider unemployment and distress than needed in the country. It's a shocker of a result, and uh, there's no doubt, I can't put a number on it, but there's no doubt a major part of the bull market in India uh, over the last few years has been the uh, results of the reforms that this government did. The threats that China poses are kind of uh, across multiple domains. And that means India, knowing that they're all matched by China on most of those fronts, needs strong partnerships. It's not just the United States, but Japan, Australia, other key partners like that. 
Well, let's get to Bloomberg Markets Asia anchor Hazinda Amin, who's been working tirelessly over the last week, giving us the latest on, on what's been coming out of Delhi. And one of the questions that I've been asking myself has is, uh, how did the exit polls get this so wrong? On Saturday, all of the exit polls suggested that Narendra Modi was in track for a landslide victory. And of course, as the results started to come through, the reality was very different. Well, never to trust exit polls, they say, Jumana. I mean, it, the real picture on the ground has been totally different. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting how some have described it not an election. It is, in fact, a political earthquake. Nobody saw this coming. We saw the reaction in the market. And investors are still digesting uh, uh, in terms of how this has panned out. Now, uh, going into the election, of course, like you said, expectations were for a landslide victory. But this was how the knife fell here in India. Uh, in terms of uh, Modi's BJP party, it secured 242 seats in Parliament. Yes, it had the most votes in terms of uh, all the other political parties. But no, it didn't get a single party majority. It needed 272 and it fell really short. Now, what happens from here? Modi and the BJP needs the help of its allies, two allies in its alliance. The problem really is these allies are not reliable. The leaders have been known to flip-flop in terms of its uh, alliance to the BJP. In fact, they started their alliance with the BJP only several months ago. So. The question is really whether they'll stick around with the BJP or their jump ship and go to the opposition. Chances are, some people say, uh, Modi will be able to keep them on board. Uh, of course, there should be horse trading. That's what people are anticipating as well. The opposition did better than most people anticipated. It had 220 odd seats in Poland, better than the other elections uh, so far. What it is likely to do as well is to get the other allies of Modi to come back to them. Now, we run the risk of having a hung parliament where both sides are unable to perhaps get a majority. It is not what the market wants. It is a possibility. It is not the best, the base case scenario, but it is still a possibility. And hence, markets are pretty anxious about how this is all going to pan out. Mm. Mm. And let's just talk about what that potential government does look like, because it seems apparent that uh, Modi will have to lean on uh, some of his allies um, from the National Democratic Alliance. And it also, it may be the case that they may not necessarily be entirely loyal to this government in the future, which raises this, the question of political stability in coming years. I think people were used to having Modi in power with the majority, uh, not really thinking about the political complex in the coming years ahead. But this certainly raises the question of how much stability there could actually be at a government level going forwards. Welcome to democracy. This is the biggest democracy in the world. It didn't work for the people, Jumana. We had a single party majority, and yet the people still feel very poor. Now, remember, this is a country with 200 billion heirs. In fact, India ranked third just behind the U.S. as well as China in terms of the number of uh, billionaires in the world. Yet, we have 800 million people in the country relying on free grain from the government. Uh, you know, that, that majority that the BJP had in parliament didn't work for it. So let's see. We, we, we've been talking about how the opposition now has a bigger, uh, I guess, hand in uh, dealing with how policies might pan out. Hopefully, they will use uh, their right to sway the policies in, in, in the right way and for the good of the people. Yeah, well, that's certainly the hope. Uh, Hazinda, thank you so much for all your coverage. That was Bloomberg Markets Asia anchor Hazinda Amin from India. Now, let's turn our focus to the latest on talks in South Africa to form a new government. This, of course, post-elections there. Now, the leader of the main opposition Democratic Alliance says investor optimism about a coalition deal with the ANC is not misplaced. John Steenhausen told us he wants to stop what he calls an anti-constitutional takeover. What I would like to see happening is constitutionalists and people who believe in uh, in, in, uh, in the market to be able to join hands and form a bulwark against the radical policies of the anti-constitutionists, which I think will have devastating consequences for South Africa's economy, its democracy and its socio-economic fabric were they to get into power.
Jennifer, our Chief Africa Correspondent, joins me now. And, and Jen, I, I feel as though watching the market price action the last couple of days, some stabilization has come through because there are hopes that ANC will actually be able to tie up uh, with the DA. And you had the opportunity to speak to the leader of the DA yesterday. Are those h hopes uh, misplaced or is there actual a real chance that this may happen? That's right, Jumana. Uh, you know, it was interesting to hear from John and just get his reflection just a few days after we got this uh, election outcome. And in particular, he says really what, what changed the discussion uh, right now in the conversations is just how well former President Jacob Zuma's MK party there uh, with the green logo at 14.5 uh, percent, just how well they did. And now, uh, you know, if we talk about uh, prior to this election, the, the ruling party, the, a the ANC and the DA, uh, these two working together was sort of a long shot, but now just considering what uh, John says are anti-constitutionalists, uh, uh, he says the choice is quite clear uh, between those who are pro-market and, and anti-market parties. Uh, and he says the focus really just needs to be on getting South Africa's economic trajectory uh, back on track. On Tuesday, we also got some more indications uh, that potentially the economic trajectory is off track. GDP numbers showed uh, that the first quarter here, uh, the South African economy economy uh, contracted. And so, uh, you know, a lot of what uh, John and, and I think a number of investors are, are waiting to see is, uh, you know, are it are we going to see a deal in which there is going to be some stability uh, for the markets and for this economy moving forward? But there's still quite a ways to go. Mm. In terms of the potential tie up, so I've been reading that it could take on multiple formats. It could be an actual coalition government or what is known as the supply and confidence agreement, whereby uh, the DA only selectively supports uh, the ANC on, on crucial votes and also put, put forward their support for the president as well. What are the likely permutations at this point? Right. Well, you know, John told us that uh, he actually said uh, they've been to coalition school and they do not plan uh, to move forward with anything that is not set in stone uh, and written and signed on. Uh, and so the plan really is uh, for them to come up with some sort of agreement if this is to be, you know, potentially a DA-ANC matchup. But I think we need to remember all of these parties are still quite far apart on, on a number of issues, uh, and we're not quite sure what are the concessions and the demands uh, that are going to be played into some of these negotiations. And so uh, for the DA specifically, John told us there's a few red lines uh, that they are not willing to negotiate on. Here, here's part of what he told us. We don't believe in expropriation without compensation. Mm -hmm. So if that is on the table as a policy, that's a red line for us. Uh, sticking with NHI in its current form mm -hmm. would be a red line for us. We believe the bill needs to be amended to include choice back into it. I think we can have universal access to basic health care. And I think there's a conversation that can be had about how best to achieve that. And, you know, it's important, Jumana, to note uh, just, you know, what a lot of these parties campaigned on uh, is potentially going to play into these negotiations. And so uh, what will be interesting to see is sort of what the ANC is discussing with these parties uh, and what their particular their red lines are, uh, who they are willing to work with. And that is really, I think, when you talk about the market action over the past few days, uh, that I think is what investors are, are waiting uh, to see. Uh, what are the concessions that are, are going to be uh, put forward or, or, or negotiated on? And, and what are the ones that are just off the table in, in order to form this government? But there is a deadline. Uh, so uh, it, it, we're going to have to know in the next two weeks. Yeah, well, fantastic that you got to speak to the leader of DA. He's a man that many uh, will be wanting to listen to. So uh, full write-up of Jennifer's interview on the terminal. Jennifer Zabasaja, our chief Africa correspondent. And elsewhere in Africa, labor unions in Nigeria have suspended a general strike that shut down the power grid and disrupted services at airports. The unions are seeking a more than tenfold increase to the minimum wage to 400,000 naira a month as a result of cost of living increases and spiraling inflation. The government has committed to a minimum wage of more than 60,000 naira a month or about 40 U.S. dollars. Both sides have agreed to hold talks daily for the next week to hash out a deal. And do not miss Bloomberg's monthly deep dive into the world of Africa's political and economic landscape. Said this Friday at 8.30 a.m. in Dubai, 6.30 a.m. in Johannesburg.
Still ahead this hour, hear why Arcom Capital is actively deploying client funds in both USD bonds and local currency for Egypt and Turkey. But first, we get the outlook for currency and debt markets with cities ahead of short-term interest rate trading. This is Bloomberg. Europeans are heading to the polls to decide the makeup of the EU Parliament. On the ballot, economic growth and industrial policy, migration, and the geopolitical challenges facing the bloc. Stick with Bloomberg as we bring you the latest election updates from across the continent and analysis about what it means for the region and beyond. Tune in all week for continuing coverage leading up to the election results on June 10th. On Bloomberg Television, context changes everything. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. Well, bond traders are tilting dovish again, piling into wagers that would benefit from a faster pace of Fed, Fed cuts. The swaps traders are now moving up expectations for the central bank's first full 25 basis point rate cut to November from December. Let's bring in Akshay Singhal, head of short-term interest rate trading at Citi. Akshay, great to have you on the show. Let's just start off with the recent batch of data that we've been getting out of the U.S. A jolts opening, surprising to the downside yesterday. ISM manufacturing also surprising uh, to the downside. What does this tell you about how the U.S. economy is evolving in terms of also how it impacts those interest rate expectations for the Fed? Yeah, thanks, Germana. Yeah, the recent uh, bit of data over the past week or so has definitely been on the weaker side. And we've seen that reflected in the yields uh, dropping, as you mentioned, about 30 basis points over the past few days. However, I think that, you know, the market generally tends to uh, anticipate and over anticipate some of these moves. And the real uh, the real proof of this is going to have to come from uh, core inflation. And unfortunately for the Fed, that remains very high. Now, Powell has been on the dovish side for quite some time, and so the market has responded to that and recognizes that they're looking to cut as quickly as they can. Uh, with the labor market weakening, it seems like that would uh, indicate that they could potentially go a little bit sooner. But I think when you really look at it, the developed central banks uh, are relying on their models uh, and really saying, oh, we expect inflation to come off because of labor market weakness because of these other factors. These are the same models that told them that it was going to be transitory in 2021. You're supposed to learn from your mistakes, but yeah. they're again, like, seem to be really undershooting inflation and expecting it to come off way before they really have the hard data. Yeah, and it's a bit of a problem. I mean, let's turn to the ECB now as well. I, I know that perhaps for this Thursday, the question is less about are they going to cut because that's priced in. Uh, but key to the investment community is what signal they give about the, in, the the coming interest rate path. And it feels now that the calculus has had to change for the ECB as well because of those upside surprises to inflation. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, the last week's prints and services inflation were much stronger than expected. And now the ECB, as they've done uh, fairly regularly in the past year, year and a half, they're stuck with the commitments that they've made previously, and they're going to have to cut rates tomorrow, as is very well expected, even though it doesn't really seem like that's the optimal policy. And I think if they had a do-over, they probably would prefer to wait and see for a little bit longer. And uh, the economists yeah. like uh, Philip and the other, other members are looking at it and saying, hey, July, we could still cut again in July. But realistically, that's not a possibility, and it's very, very unlikely for that to happen. And more and more, it looks like this might be a one and done from the ECB as uh, they wait for much longer to see really sustained decline in inflation before cutting again. Well, wow, one and done would be major. Actually, how do you think the euro would respond to that? And how do you think traders are positioned? Do you think there is an anticipation that the ECB could only cut once? I think... Traders over the past couple of years have learned that the central banks are uh, primarily data driven. And if the data doesn't support additional cuts, the ECB will end up kind of retracing and saying, yeah, we're not going to cut anymore. 
And so I think what we'll, what we'll see tomorrow is that uh, while the projections are going to be lower for inflation, uh, it does uh, mean that Lagarde will not be committing to any uh, further cuts, and she will try to reiterate the meeting-by-meeting meeting policy. Uh, and I think, you know, with how much we've priced out from the Fed and the ECB already in the first half of the year, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that uh, we can continue to price out more of those cuts. Uh, the real question ends up being, are we actually in restrictive territory sufficiently to get inflation down quickly? Yeah, uh, that is the key question for many central bankers. Actually, going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Actually, Singal, head of short-term interest rate trading at City. Thank you. And plenty more ahead. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa. We'll be back in a short moment. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. Now for a look at some of the other stories we're following this morning. Intel is selling a stake in a plant in Ireland to Apollo Global Management for $11 billion, boosting funding for a massive expansion of its factory network. Meanwhile, CEO Pat Gelsinger has taken aim at rival NVIDIA in the fight for AI chip dominance. He used the Computex trade show to hit back at Jensen Huan, who earlier said traditional processors like Intel's were running out of steam. Now have a billion transistors on a single chip and even looking to a trillion transistors in a single package by the end of the, de the decade. And unlike what Jensen might have you believe, Moore's Law is alive and well. Elon Musk has confirmed that he diverted artificial intelligence chips away from Tesla to his X and X AI ventures. In a series of posts on X, he wrote that Tesla had no place to put the NVIDIA chips other than to store them in a warehouse. CNBC reported earlier that Musk redirected 12,000 H100 graphics processing units originally slated for Tesla, citing an NVIDIA memo from December. And HPE shares gained in late trade after second quarter revenue beat analyst estimates on a big jump in sales of servers built to handle AI work. Profit of 42 cents per share topped the average forecast of 39 cents. The strong performance was due to the company's server business, with sales of AI-oriented systems doubling from the first quarter to more than $900 million. And also coming up, our next guest says the month of May left a very early Christmas present for MENA credit investors. We'll unwrap the details next with our Calm Capital. This is Bloomberg. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa, our top stories this morning. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi loses his majority in parliament, forcing him to lean on allies to form a government. The Indian result surprising investors, the stock bulls reeling after a route that wiped out $386 billion in market value. And the leader of South Africa's main opposition tells Bloomberg the party is open to coalition talks with the ANC that put the nation's interests first. It's just gone 8.30 a.m. across the Emirates. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai, getting you up to speed on all of the latest out of these elections. We had them in India, South Africa, Mexico, creating a lot of volatility in those stock market indices. But for now, let's also just focus on some of our key markets. Wall Street trading sideways. We had those weaker-than-expected jolts opening. Data come out yesterday, surprising to the downside. That on back of the ISM number that disappointed earlier on in the week. Traders have started to bring forward the timing of that first interest rate cut now priced for November. And you can see behind me, the stock futures are seen opening up slightly green today, up two tenths of a percent. Ten-year Treasury is also in focus. Massive rally last couple of sessions, down 30 basis points in four days, sitting just around that 200-day moving average of around 4.32, 4.33-ish. Euro also in focus, not doing a lot today. But uh, again, the, uh, a lot of expectations building to that ECB meeting on Thursday. The, the feeling from the market is that they're going to cut interest rates, but perhaps send a signal that they're not prepared to start a series of rate cuts on the back of that. So something to watch out for, a potential hawkish surprise. And then Brent also 
very much struggling to catch a bid after that OPEC meeting and the announcement on Sunday that they are going to resume putting oil barrels back into the market. Uh, big moves yesterday in the nifty market in India, as you can see from here, massive drop. The index dro uh, fell about 6% during the course of the day, wiping out $390 billion from market cap. So a lot of volatility and unexpected results as those uh, Indian elections results became apparent. And it looked like Modi was not going to get the super majority he was looking for, or even the majority that he was hoping for as well, uh, creating a lot of turbulence in that market. And for more on how these Asian markets markets are reacting. Let's get out to Avril Hong in Singapore. Absolutely, Jumana. We have the Sensex, the Nifty, after declining 6% yesterday in India, really struggling to recoup those losses today. And that's despite the likes of Goldman saying the earnings story, that is still looking strong. The growth story also looks intact. Uh, we're seeing the gauge has been fluctuating in and out of green and the red as investors wait to hear about the makeup of the Indian government and how this will go on to perhaps inform the economic policy of the country. Now, we've also been keeping a really close watch on the Adani group of stocks. About $45 billion of market cap wiped out yesterday, and they are extending those declines today. The flagship Adani Enterprises, well in negative territory with Ad Adani Energy Solutions leading those losses as well. Let's flip the board and take a look at what we're seeing across some of the other Indian assets on those Indian bonds. Uh, we're seeing the yield continuing to climb. Remember, they have been previously supported in the anticipation of bond index inclusion, as well as that hallmark of the Modi administration, fiscal discipline, seen as you know, music to the sound, uh, music to the ears, I should say, of bond investors. Uh, but you can see here that's really coming off today, even though the rupee is recovering some lost ground. And all this is coming on the day when developed market bonds are rallying in line with U.S. Treasury's performance overnight. Jumana. Yeah, important to make that distinction because it's been quite the run for fixed income, but not for local bonds in India. Avril, thank you so much for that overview. Well, speaking of fixed income, Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund is selling a two-tranche sterling de denominated bond to attract new buyers. Bloomberg understands the PIF is marketing 650 million pounds of five and 15 year bonds. The fund has already raised funds from Islamic and dollar bonds this year. Interesting to note that they're issuing in sterling. Let's bring in Fadi Gandhi, senior fixed income portfolio manager at Arcom Capital. Wonderful to see you after so many years. We knew each other in a previous life. Exactly. Um, let me just start off by asking you about the general move in fixed income, maybe just starting with U.S. Treasuries, because we have rallied quite aggressively the last couple of sessions, 10 years sitting at 4.3. Do you think it continues? So we now think we're at the lower end of the range of four and a quarter to four and three quarters. We've come down a long way because of the weaker ISM, yeah. NFP and retail sales. So I think for us to go back to the beginning of the year range of three and three quarters to 4.25% on the 10 year would require a clear deterioration in the data. Maybe we'll get some signs of that with the NFP on Friday. But for now, we think that we'll stay in the yeah. four and a quarter to four and three quarters range. It doesn't matter what the Fed do. I mean, the, the market is sitting around November for the first rate cut. Uh, how do you think that affects where duration ends up? So there's a lot of anxiety about what the Fed will do. And we've gone from six rate cuts beginning of the year to almost zero. Now we're back to around one to two rate cuts. So that will have a big, uh, big impact on, uh, on markets and, and, and duration as well. So yeah. having a clear stance on the Fed well, you know, will feed into your duration position. Yeah. So let's talk about how this translates to local markets. I've been keeping a close eye on Saudi issuance this year. There's been plenty come through. In fact, I was reading statistic on the Bloomberg terminal that uh, Saudi Arabia actually has been the biggest issuer in dollar denominated debt out of the EM community this year. Fascinating because we talk about, you know, Saudi's funding needs. Uh, how do you see the Saudi bond market at this juncture? So Saudi is a credit that we like fundamentally. They are trying to diversify away from oil as part of their Saudi Vision 2030. Nonetheless, this requires a lot of funding needs, both at the sovereign level and the GREs. And as you alluded to with PIF's issuance in GPP and with, with the Saudi go government's issuances in SAR, they're tapping all sources 
uh, available to them. And, um, and the fact that they are tapping into the SAR market is positive for us hard currency investors as it reduces pressure in terms of yeah. you know, issuance plans well, on the well, dollar that's, front. That's what I was going to say because it feels as though you know, the funding pressures are there. They're doing the Aramco secondary share offering now. That's equities. I'm not going to ask you about mm -hmm. that. But it, it does tell you that if you fast forward to the coming years, Saudi Arabia's funding needs are going to go bigger and bigger, which means they'll probably have to issue more and take on more debt. So do you think where the debt is trading right now is ad adequately pricing in the premium of more issuance to come in coming years? So it's, 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 it's always moving. Right now, the, where Saudi is trading versus the likes of Qatar and Abu Dhabi, there is definitely a, a premium added to the Saudi curve to account for the, you know, the expected issuances to come. We don't foresee any issuance now from, from now till September due to the summer lull. Mm -hmm. So we think that if there's any issuance risk, it will be September onwards. And, and I think the DMO in, in Saudi Arabia is, is always speaking with investors and, and, and trying to allay some of these concerns about yeah. issuance. Yeah. Let's talk about Egypt. Um, I know it's a, a country that, that you look at very closely. Uh, yesterday, again, interesting to see their foreign reserves are now at a record high after the bailout received earlier in the year. I know there's been a lot of optimism about the Egyptian economy since that bailout a few months ago. How do you feel about things as a fixed income investor? So we're very positive on Egypt. It's one of our key overweights. We turned um, overweight Egypt hard currency bonds end of Feb with the announcement of the Ras al Hikma deal. Mm. And we increased our overweight on March 6th following the uh, jumbo rate hike and the deval of the pound. We feel that a lot of the, uh, our concerns on Egypt have been addressed. There is an IMF program. There is structural reform, tight monetary and fiscal policies. Uh, de facto support from the from the GCC and we've reflected that in our mandates by going overweight not just the hard currency bonds but also very early on in March we entered the local currency trade so the EGP T-bill trade and that has you know been been offering very handsome rewards over the last uh, three months and we continue to have exposure to both the hard currency and the local currency well, front. It sounds like a very bullish argument. Uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge right now? What, what, what are you concerned about in Egypt? So with, with Egypt, considering that it is in the end a single B emerging market sovereign with plenty of bonds outstanding. So we think the risks are twofold. One risk is exogenous. So if you do have um, a, you know, very sticky inflation in the US and you have a stronger dollar that impacts the EGP and you have reduced foreign appetite for local currency debt. So we need to keep an eye out on what's happening outside of Egypt. Within Egypt, the key risk is, um, is if there's any loss in reform momentum mm -hmm. due to the $60 billion uh, uh, of funds that have been you know, earmarked for the sovereign. But yeah. we think they will continue with with, with the structural reforms that they have promised. Mm, well, well, indeed, the news overnight, of course, is that a new government is going to be put together, specifically yes. tasked with enacting those reforms. Uh, one other final one I just want to throw out there. Qatar, I thought, was interesting because they came back to the market after a long hiatus, very tight spread, but seems to be well received by the market, and it was a green bond. Yes. Yeah. So we, uh, from our end, we've, we've had an underweight position on some of these expensive, rich, uh, GCC IG sovereigns where the spread buffers are very limited, um, li like the likes of uh, Qatar, Abu Dhabi and the UAE, especially with the rates vol. Mm -hmm. So the ability of spreads to absorb these sharp swings in rate is very limited. But nonetheless, this goes back to the tug of four between spreads and yields. Spreads are tight if you're a spread investor, but all in yields on a double A rated Qatar sovereign that hasn't come to the market in four years yeah. is attractive for some DM crossover investors as well as some, uh, you know, uh, yield players. Well, that's the thing. So uh, credit guys will look at the spread and say this is extremely tight and then duration guys will be like, well, you know, it's four and a half percent yields. We love it. We'll take it. That's that's the distinction. Fadi, great to have you on. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much for coming on our show today. Fadi Gandhi, Senior Fixed Income Portfolio Manager at Arcom Capital. <laughs> Now, also coming up, Saudi Arabia's newest airline, Riyadh Air, is putting all the pieces together ahead of its debut next year. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun says the growing isolationist rhetoric out of the U.S. and other nations will damage global economies. He told us the trend is concerning for companies like Boeing, which rely on trade. I'm worried that the ramifications of isolation uh, are going to, are gonna, I, I don't want to overstate the word, 
but they're going to bring down economies. Isolation then breeds disenchantment, and disenchantment ultimately breeds political turnover. So I, that's the world I worry about with respect to isolation, and I don't like any of the signs I see. Meanwhile, rival Airbus is hoping to close a new deal with China for more than 100 of its wide-body A330 Neo aircraft. Talks have gained momentum since Chinese President Xi Jinping visited his French counterpart Emmanuel Macron last month. Terms are still being discussed and the timing of a deal is uncertain. Certainly interesting from a geopolitical perspective. And Singapore Airlines and Riyadh Air have signed a new deal to establish a closer commercial relationship during IATA's annual gathering in Dubai. Saudi Arabia's newest airline is looking to expand its network of partnerships with established carriers ahead of its debut next year. So for more, let's bring in Asia Transport reporter Danny Lee. Oh. I spoke to Tony Douglas uh, from Riyadh Air, actually my first show here on May the 6th, and he was talking about the excitement, obviously, ahead of that launch in 2025. And I do wonder how important these types of tie-ups are for Riyadh Air when they do eventually start to commercial operations. Why are these tie-ups with Singapore Airlines going to be key? Yeah, Riyadh Air is so ambitious, and you hear that just from Tony Douglas. You know, going around talking about this Riyadh Air project, more than just a project, a physical manifestation of the ambition you know, Riyadh has, Saudi Arabia, and this Vision 2030 program. So you look at someone like Riyadh Air, the kind of partnerships it's looking to have. This is the first one, by the way. Uh, quality airlines, top quality airlines, partnering with the world's best. And you know, when you want to have an airline with 100 destinations by 2030, it doesn't just need help getting people from the rest of the world to Riyadh. Mm. It needs to get people from the other side of the world and onwards. So these kind of partnerships are going to be very important. And the ambition is there. And he's underlined it with mm. this first kind of uh, initial partnership, which could potentially grow into something more once Riyadh Air starts flying from next year. Yes, I've spoken to many Saudi Arabian ministers about their hopes for tourism. And at QEF, I actually had a panel with the Saudi Arabian tourism minister. The numbers keep growing. I just wonder if with the entrance of Riyadh Air into the market, whether we could be looking at overcapacity. Are the numbers really going to match up versus, you know, all of the airlines that exist in the region? It really is a big question because when you look at some of the ambitions that are being said and mentioned by not just Riyadh Air, but obviously the, 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 the first one, the original Emirates, and mm. we've you know, still got many, many hundreds of planes on order, and then you see the rest following Qatar Airways, uh, and you see others. It's, it's you know, it's, everyone's pretty bullish, and it's not just about, you know, getting people to this region, but they just want to be a global player, and many are already. And so I think just the, the, the sentiment is there, and, yeah. well, they're, they're spending money, which is great for the uh, plane makers who are, you know, building these planes. Yeah, and also one interesting thing to note, it sort of ties up into our theme today, uh, India is set to be a huge market. So how do you think that's going to tap into some of the demand into the region? Yeah, I mean, India has always been a, you know, a huge lure for the Middle East. And you see, you see the likes of Emirates who want to, and Qatar Airways always want to fly even more to India. But clearly they're, they're restricted in many ways. But, you know, for the Middle East region and Middle East aviation as a whole, everyone is interested, whether it be airlines wanting to do more deals and more partnerships, or as we see with the number of planes we hear looking to be ordered as we've just come off this uh, from Dubai this IATA meeting of annual airlines people talking about ordering 200 planes which is a lot yeah. and you see some airlines in Europe who are minnows compared to what the Middle East has grown up into yeah yeah decidedly upbeat I would say is the yeah. summary of this latest IATA great to have you in town Danny thanks for coming on our show that was Asia transport reporter Danny Lee also coming up, Indian Prime Minister Modi's narrow election win could put his 8% growth plan at risk. We discuss the implications with the opposition Congress party next. This is Horizons Middle East and Africa. Welcome back to Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Bursachi in Dubai.
Uh, let's get in uh, a quick check on how some of these key Indian markets are faring. And some stabilization has come through. Yesterday, Sensex dropped almost 6%, its biggest decline in four years, a huge amount of volatility, uh, the, one of the largest ever on the back of that election result, unexpected to say the least for the investment community. But some stabilization is coming through now. This as Narendra Modi is vowing on to stay on as Indian Prime Minister, even as his BJP party loses its parliamentary majority in a surprise swing to rivals. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Manaka Doshi in New Delhi, who is standing by with our next guest. Well, thank you for that, Jamana. As you just mentioned, Prime Minister Modi has returned to power, but with a weakened mandate. And one of the parties responsible for that is the principal opposition party in the country, the Congress Party. I'm joined today by Praveen Chakravarti. He's the chairman of the Congress Party's data analytics cell, as well as the author of its election manifesto. Praveen, thank you very much for speaking to us here on Bloomberg. Um, you know, I know that the Congress seems to be in a victorious mood, but Prime Minister Modi says he's one a historic third mandate and in fact the BJP seats uh, outdo all of the opposition seats combined so why do you feel this has been somewhat of a victory for the opposition before that I do have to correct you a bit uh, is not returned to power yet and it's not a mandate for governance yet as we speak now is mm -hmm. not in power for a third term that's not confirmed Th mr. Modi's party is short of a majority and they will need alliance partners to form government. But the fact that there is already palpable tension and uncertainty about it tells you how alliance unfriendly is Mr. Modi and his party perceived to be. Now, coming to why does the Congress feel victorious, first, the Congress party doubled its seats. That, whatever said and done, well, there's still only 100 seats, Correct. a far cry from where the Congress used to be a little over a decade ago. Absolutely. But it still, it marks a significant U-turn in the party's revival. So that's number one. The number two, I think, is the party is victorious and celebratory for the nation because even if Mr. Modi forms a government, it will be a restrained Modi. A restrained Modi means restoration of freedoms and fearlessness in Indian society, because we know what an unrestrained Modi can do over the last decade. It could also mean a chaotic parliament, the inability to pass legislation, uh, you know, um, all kinds of issues and blocks that could impact economic growth. So I do want to ask what kind of opposition you're going to be. But before that, where do you think you got these votes from? What or how did people respond to specific causes in your manifesto or in your promises? Yes. Uh, see, um, Minika, our um, approach to the elections was about issues. And the primary issue was jobs. Mr. Modi said, temple. Voters said, thank you for the temple. Where is my job? That explained what the Congress Party's um, ups upsurge was. And this is exemplified in the fact that in the city where Mr. Modi built that grand temple, the BJP lost. So it's clearly people are saying, temple is all right, where are the jobs? And it's primarily economic. I think the lipstick has worn off Mr. Modi among voters, and now it's back to bread and butter basic economic issues. If it's primarily economic, then jobs is a concern across the country. But you haven't made gains across the country. They've been only in specific states. Uh, so the, you know, I, I think the, the critics say that the Congress is making too much of this. Um, the, I mean, Uttar Pradesh is the largest state in India, which is where there's been a massive anti-BJP uh, uh, and anti-Modi swing. And so if the largest state is telling you something, then it, yes, the, it's not made, uh, uh, say, gains in uh, smaller states like Delhi. But we are... But in the second largest state, Maharashtra, there's been a massive swing but again. That, that, that is being attributed so, to political churn specific to that state. I mean, pundits may attribute sure? uh, okay, many so things to So in your feedback, are you sure the jobs, uh, economic issues, uh, inflation, these were key to why voters picked you and helped you double your seats? Absolutely. And not just in my analysis, actually objective third-party analysis by organizations such as CSDS tell you, show you uh, data that voters were very, very clear this time. Tell us what is the plan for economic issues such as jobs and inflation. 
I already mentioned that the BJP on its own has more seats than all of the opposition parties combined, but that doesn't mean that you all might not try your hand at making government. Is that what's going on today? Because I do believe the India opposition group is meeting today, all of its leaders. Um, is that what you're going to try, to try and wean away the BJP's allies? Yeah, just like in markets, in politics, anything can happen. But um, I have to, I did tell you that Mr. Modi personally and the number two in the BJP are seen as extremely alliance unfriendly. They are known to be breaking up other parties, regional parties. So it is only natural that many parties or most parties are fearful and skeptical about joining hands with it. But equally, I hear that the BJP might wean away some of your alliance parties, uh, you know, the smaller ones that might be happy to get a ministerial post and join the BJP alliance, thereby boosting their numbers. How will you keep your flock together? Again, in politics, it's open game. In Indian politics, at least, it's open game. And when will we have finality? Uh, your guess is as good as mine. Praveen Chakravarti, thank you very much for joining us here on Bloomberg. Thank you. And with that, Jamana, it's back to you in Dubai. Menaka, thank you so much. Really fascinating to hear what the opposition have to say about all these potential election permutations. Fantastic interview. That was Bloomberg's Menaka Doshi speaking to Praveen Chakravarti, chairman at the Congress Party Data Analytics Cell. And a look at our main markets today, uh, taking a look at equity futures. All of the major indices are now pointing towards green. This after a softish close yesterday. Uh, but, of course, a major focus for European investors ahead is going to be the ECB meeting on Thursday. A rate cut is all but penciled in, but language is going to be deciphered very closely. Treasury is also in focus. We've seen a massive rally the last couple of days. U.S. 10 years down 30 basis points, sitting at 4.34. That is just above the 200-day moving average. And finally, quick look at oil before we head out. It cannot seem to get a bid post that OPEC meeting, sitting at $77 for brands. But that is it for our show, Horizons Middle East and Africa. I'm Jumana Versace in Dubai. Stay with us for Daybreak Europe. This is Bloomberg.